Welcome to the Building Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Austin Tunnell, and I'm excited because I've got John Anderson on today, also known as R. John the Bad, um, who I came across back in, I think, 2015 or 2016, and I'll give a little backstory there. But um, John, could you give a little bit of background about what you've done and where you're at now? And also, if you don't mind including some of the things that you've talked before about about even how the 2008 financial crisis, what you were doing before then, and how that shaped even your thinking, your philosophy about development and building and architecture going forward. Okay, so no pressure then. All right. <laughs> None at all. Easy question. Well, um, I'll go back further because you know, everyone loves a good story, you know, uh, a good redemption story. Um, I started out uh, in the trades. Well, Actually, I quit high school when they wouldn't let me take any more shop classes. Um, I have ADHD. Um, so I would get A's in shop and F's in incomplete and whatever else. And they were worried about my academic future, being able to get into a good college. So they wouldn't let me take any more shop classes. So at 16, I was on my own and I just never went back after Christmas vacation one year. The, uh, um, so at the time, also, I, I, I worked in the sort of places that you work in if you drop out of high school. It was a scrapyard, uh, kitchens, and uh, construction. And the scrapyard was kind of shady, so that wasn't for me. Um, and the dogs weren't particularly friendly. Um, I didn't want to work as hard as people that own restaurants do. Um, so that I kind of, by default, I ended up in construction. And the, at the time, I, I mean, I, I was in Duluth, Minnesota, at the end of Lake Superior. Um, and I had a buddy who I'd worked with uh, who offered to get me into the electrical union in, in New York, in Manhattan, in Brooklyn. And so I went out and did that, worked my way through the apprentice program and made journeyman. And about six months after that, I was running a crew uh, in a subway station and I, we were pulling cable and I took a fall off of a scaffold about, about 20 feet to the concrete and shattered my shoulder. And that kind of redirected my dream of having three or four trucks in a, you know, in a shop in Corona Queens or something. Um, and uh, for part of the rehab, uh, they, the state set me up in a job drafting in an architect's office. Um, I was doing actually electrical design, but that's not very many sheets. And this is all before CAD. Uh, so I was mostly picking up red lines from everybody else, manually drafting. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. Um, but because I really had no designs on like going to university and becoming an architect, um, I ended up, uh, well, if we need measured drawings of a shitty old building, then yeah, we'll send John. Or we need to have a really contentious meeting with the, uh, with the contractor about these change orders. So let's send John. Those are his people. So in, re in reality, they were much more my people than the folks in the architect's office. So uh, after a couple of years, I took a job with the local contractor and developers, sometimes building owners, uh, and worked my way up from, you know, superintendent to estimating and project management. And um, always with the idea, of never really settling in on one company. It's like always chasing the next project. Kind of like folks in the film business. Um, and always looking for a bigger project than the last one. And an operation with more sophistication and efficiency, you know. And... Uh, so the, the, uh, the unfortunate end of that enterprise was I spent four years working for the developer at the Mall of America, one of seven project managers. Uh, and my job was the schedule and to some extent the budget. And after four years of doing that, um, hung out a shingle on my own. It, it, it became really clear that um, at that scale, four million square feet of retail and a amusement park under seven acres of glass. Um, 
we were, I, I was really disappointed to find out that in the major leagues, um, there's more zeros associated with the budget um, and more hollering, but we were much more creative and uh, clever in the minor leagues. So, uh, so I, I love that way to say it. <laughs> well, more, more zeros and more arguing. <laughs> well, I was working for a company that involved a lot of screaming uh, <clears throat> the culture. Uh, and we were set up, our team was set up on the site. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of interaction with the home office. Um, but uh, so 92 hung out a shingle, did contract project management. And one of my clients was a guy doing townhouse infill in the Twin Cities. And, uh, and that was much more appealing to me. I was living in a streetcar extension of St. Paul uh, in an old Sears and Roebuck uh, kit house, um, active in the local, I was on the board of the local CDC uh, doing work in the neighborhood. And so um, hung out a shingle, ended up going to Seaside to uh, that time Andreas Duani had kind of a road show of the technique of town planning, which was what kind of, year, what decade is this? Is this eighties uh, or is this nineties? Let's see. How old were you in 1996? Uh, I would have been uh, eight years old. Yeah. When you were eight years old, back when dinosaurs still roamed the earth. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so I went to seaside. The class is in like the, the community room behind the Modica market. Uh, and you're there at Seaside. It's pretty awesome. Also, none of the other stuff that was built up on 30A was there. So it was really kind of a stark contrast. Um, so I spent three days arguing with, with Andreas. Uh, and his uh, rather gracious response to that was to appoint me to no less than six committees of the CNU. And after about number six, I just say, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's the CNU? Oh, we're meeting in Charleston next month. You must come. And you know, the my my friends from Minnesota are like, oh, he's telling you you have, you have to call. Him. That used to be that was just by invitation. It's like, oh, okay, never been to Charleston. So a month later, I'm in Charleston, and um, and it was the that was uh, CMU four. That's when we signed the charter. Uh, but that's also. Uh, I was really skeptical because like the guys from Disney were there with celebration. Um, I'd just seen a couple of uh, really unfortunate kind of projects in California that were in the, the new urbanism book that um, in the recession had gone back to the bank. And I was very skeptical and, um, and then, but we're in Charleston, which is amazing. you know, And to see, what had been done with simple two and three story frame buildings in the neighborhoods of Charleston uh, was just intoxicating. You know, the, the last night we were there, I walked until dawn with uh, Aaron Parker, you know, just looking at everything we could. Uh, but the, the really big thing, more than chart signing the charter, which was kind of like, okay, whatever. Uh, this all makes sense. You know, uh, it was the first time I heard Leon Creer talk. And I'd never heard of Leon Career or read his books or anything. And it was like, oh, my God. Uh, if what this guy says is true, I have to do this for the rest of my life. I really hope it's not true. because I'm curious. What, 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 what did he – do you remember what he was talking about then that actually captured your – because you were already in Seaside. You've already been listening to Andres Duane. So obviously it's not the first time you're hearing these things. What did Leon say that kind of sounds well, like got to your well, heart a little said, bit more? Even more than Andreas, he's a polemicist. He's presenting, you know, two uh, conditions, right? The traditional city, you know, the quarter, the mixed use, and the, the abstract system of dividing everything and reconnecting it with a road, the suburban experience. So his cartoons, his diagrams, uh, there's one where uh, there's a central city, and then there's the suburbs, and there's camps. Some of my favorite ones firing vehicles into the central city. And then there's another one uh, was uh, kind of a, a flash cube building, like the one I used to work at in Mall of yeah. America, uh, and a human face. And it's like the, the closer you get, the more detail you see for the human face. And the closer you get to the flash cube building, 
it's pretty much the same. It's, it's very kind of two dimensional. So the and so then the, the diagram about um, uh, the private buildings, civic buildings, uh, public space. It's like the so it was really it just reinforcing that framework for uh, the way that we built cities for thousands of years makes a tremendous amount of sense. And many of those cities are actually reasonably well adapted to having vehicles. Um, so, you know, what can, how do we make that shift? How do we build differently? Mm-hmm. So it, it, it created a, a, a much bigger context for, you know, it's one thing to build a new town, you know, in an environment, in a condition like a Greenfield project, like a resort on the Gulf of Mexico, like white sand beaches, or to do infill in the most expensive neighborhoods of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, but, you know, what about, what about for regular folks? So the idea that uh, a walkable mixed use neighborhood with slow speed streets, but access to the wider world um, makes everybody's life uh, so much better. And right now, if anytime you build that or you, or you rebuild that, it gets really bid up because it's really desirable. And so the, so I felt like I now had kind of a North star to, to navigate by. It's like, yeah, it's really worth doing things well this way, which precipitated several years of frustration when people would not uh, bow down to the beauty of our weapons. You know, it's like, Oh yes, we'll change all our zoning codes. You know, the, um, I mean, Larry Curry didn't have anything to say about here's the argument you use with the fire marshal, you know, or the utility companies, <clears throat> or your local realtor. Yeah, he's well. just telling you where the North Star is, and you got to figure yeah. out how to hack your way there. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, uh, so went back to Minneapolis. Um, I had a contract with the state DOT um, at that time representing, you know, I would go to the different, uh, I was in the office of access management, which is in, for most DOTs at that time, it's like the really shitty part of suburb of, uh, Siberia, you know, that nobody that really had a lot of ambition within the department wanted to be in that department. Um, so the, my job was to go with my, uh, dual carousel projectors, you know, before PowerPoint, uh, to go to the district offices around the state and explain why it would be a really good idea if state highways, as they went into town, became designed differently. Then it was probably going to be a problem. We were going to continue to remove the on-street parking in front of the storefronts. You know, the, this kind of radical thinking at the time. Yeah. Um, and usually on my way back, you know, half an hour, an hour later, headed back toward the Twin Cities from the frontier offices. I would get a phone call, a cell phone call from my boss. He said, that must have gone really well. It's like, really? How, how do you know? It's like, well, district engineer called and recommended that I fire you. It's like, and that became the metric for whether or not I was being sufficiently disruptive. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and one, on one occasion, uh, and he had hired me specifically because he, he wanted somebody to be a change agent. Uh, and he was known within the department as someone who was a change agent and might be a dangerous fellow, might be elevated to deputy commissioner at some point. So it was a lot of, I was from that camp, you know, and there was one particular occasion where I got the phone. When I finally got back into cell phone range, I got the phone call from the boss. It says, that must've been the best presentation ever. I said, why are they, would they really, would they swear when they said that you should fire me? No, no, no. They called the commissioner and asked that the commissioner fire me. <laughs> so, you know, that's so, incredible. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> um, well, it was, uh, oh, that's pretty it funny. It was in the far, <laughs> farthest north, most isolated region of, of the, of the state. And, those kind of uh, district offices were very appealing for people in the August of their careers um, who had lots of vacation time accumulated in places with really good hunting and fishing. I see. These were not the dens of innovation you might think they would be. 
Yeah. The, uh, uh, but also, I'm amazed on that short, just uh, how many public servants literally make decisions based on what makes their job the easiest. Or, or the rest of their life most interesting. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, the not to bash, I don't want to bash folks on the public side um, without cause. But the, the benefit I had in spending three years in the DOT was that I met people that um, I was surprised to meet so many people that were sincere and determined about the idea of public service. You know, they were, yeah. they were all in. And then the rest of them, maybe 80% had come to a point where they realized it wasn't everything they thought it was going to be. But since they only had nine or 10 more years to get fully vested, proceed to make the rest of their life interesting. Right. And in that setting, you can kind of, pick those folks out in the, in the big cubicle space because of the, the, the totems, you know, that they had in their cubicle for scouting their church, right. <clears throat> quilting, you know, fishing, bowling, golf, you know, all this other stuff, you know, um, and some of them were real active in like the professional associations and things, hoping to advance the, uh, the profession. But, I think that they, uh, I think the only way you survive in that kind of environment, I mean, it's a good thing that infrastructure and human civilization doesn't turn on a dime. You know? mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we've been building the wrong model and we've institutionalized that. But to their credit, I think the, uh, the key to uh, taking the long view inside of a public uh, agency is that you have to adjust um, to the metabolism of change possible in that environment. Some cities, way to say have, you know, really dynamic elected officials and senior staff that things are going to move faster. But if the metabolism is slow, you need, I mean, I was told that I had to telecommute after nine months on the job because my boss was really tired of people coming into his office and interrupting him asking, what is John Anderson doing? I, that's not good. You know, it's like, well, no, he's doing what he was hired to do. And uh, I can arrange for you to sit down with him and he can explain it more. It's like, no, no, I've done that. He's kind of a dick. So the, uh, uh, also I was a contract employee. I mean, they could fire me without cause. And I figured, you know, um, after a year of that, I figured getting relieved of showing up at that office would be a good thing. So I tended to push the envelope with Right. But, uh, but I, I, uh, I used to have kind of a, a typical builder developer, uh, prejudice against folks in public service and being a chance to work there for three years and finding people that are genuinely uh, committed to the ideal of public service, um, was a chance for me to grow up a little bit. I only That's do a that good way to say it. short pieces. <laughs> The, uh, I would assume it's kind of the same. I mean, you've got um, <clears throat> just like there's amazing people in the profession, whether it's engineers or architects or city planners or builders or GCs. Um, and then there's a lot of bad ones and then the most mediocre one. I mean, if it's a bell curve, you know, you can kind of apply that to, to most things. <laughs> and that's probably going to hold true. Uh, well, but I have, you know, John, I'm actually interested in kind of hearing from you on this because I struggle to critique professions or whatever that need critiqued because, and by the way, most good people in those professions would agree with what I'm saying, but how do you do it without being offensive or just kind of like throwing everyone in? Because it sounds like, you know, maybe you've landed on ways to do that um, well or, or better. You've learned lessons. Well, I've learned how to do it kind of within my own limitations, personality wise. Um, my wife will tell you that I am slow, but trainable. Um, the Andreas once told me that, look, you can either be popular or you can be effective, but it is very difficult to be both. So you got to pick a lane. And so um, I don't have the f sufficient diplomatic skill set to be popular. Um, and I like to think I can be effective. Uh, but it's usually by working in a team environment where, um, as a group, you 
as a team, you agree what the strategic points of critique should be mm-hmm. and how to build that case and how to build trust before you start hammering people with how they should reform their profession. The, Seems uh, like a good piece of advice right there. Well, the, uh, uh, I mean, when people criticize my work, my initial kind of glandular reaction is like, well, what's your genius plan then, buddy? It's like the, I worked hard to get, to become right. borderline effective here. And uh, if you're coming for me, I want to see your homework. So, right. Um, but that's not particularly effective. I think that the, um, I mean, if you told, oh, let me finish the other story was that, we're, we're now working, uh, we started a little planning firm uh, and we're doing counter projects and we get our first charrette and we're doing that. And then uh, Andreas wanted to publish a book of uh, house plans from various new awareness projects around the country so we can eliminate the excuse of, well, I don't have any product that would fit this subdivision when you do it this way, this alley at the back thing. And so... I kind of had letters of Mark uh, and called up everybody that I could, I could think of uh, any referral I got from Andreas, the list of attendees from CNU four and asked them, you know, we're going to publish this thing. So we did three different uh, editions of that uh, working with a kind of a mainstream publishing house uh, for stock plans. Um, and, but that, um, and then I went on Andreas's roadshow, you know, kind of, uh, touting the look. Now we have plans that fit 50 foot lots with an alley, uh, which was, I felt like we'd inv- invented the sharpened stick at that point. That's, and I ended up doing a fair amount of, uh, uh, table scrap projects from DPZ. At that time, their marketing approach was to answer the phone and decide what work not to take. Um, this is before the Great Recession. And so if somebody had nine acres in Charlotte and they were a builder, it's like, well, have them call John Anderson. Those, those are his people. So I was bouncing around Florida, South Carolina, uh, North Carolina, Texas, uh, doing uh, plans and entitlement, you know, uh, master plans, urban design work and entitlement work. And then in most cases, the, it's like the, the, the builder developer clients would get the ball to the two yard line and then kind of walk off the field. And then the utility company and the civil engineers would take the project. And now the roads are too big and the curb radii is too huge. And, and now there's curb and gutter in the, in the alley and, but the utilities are in the front yards and the, uh, the de- and at some point the decision was made to sell it to a local production builder. And now the houses that should be raised are now slab on grade, you know, 10, 12 feet back from the sidewalk. So the, uh, and because you're working with folks that are new to all of this, they didn't know that those were consequential decisions. Um, the, uh, and I was a bit vigorous in my, you know, it must be this way. So I, I don't imagine that calling me up to say that, hey, we sold the project to a production builder was very high on their list. So I was about to say, what did you learn? Did you take anything away from that? Seeing like you're doing all this work and then you're seeing projects not come to fruition, probably to a little bit of your surprise, I would assume. Like what was your reaction and what did you decide to change or did you even get a chance to change? Because I know 2008 hit. <laughs> well, I... I, I learned that if you start off with your critique of what got built with a lot of colorful language and expletives, that people <laughs> kind of clean it out, you know, that you're just a jerk. You know. um, and I developed a little bit more of a Socratic method of, well, when it came time to do this, what, what were the decisions in front of you? What, you know? I need to learn from you on this, honestly, John. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, well, I'm not the greatest at this uh, right now. Well, if, well, again, I'll finish the story. So I was bouncing around all over the place. Uh, I'm living in St. Paul, uh, and I would get depressed in the wintertime with the low light level. 
then I would go to Austin or to Orlando or, you know, um, St. Petersburg or something. And within a day or two felt great. And then go home to my, you know, the embrace of my family and feel like I'm putting a gun in my mouth. Just, just really dramatic mm. uh, bits of depression over just the gray six months of winter. Um, and so, um, after a particularly painful uh, disappointment in Charlotte, um, I decided that what I what I really needed to do was get back to building and find a place where we could do even just a remnant, you know, uh, neighborhood reasonably close to services, uh, something like New Point in, in Buford. Uh, I'd do something like that. I could demonstrate and, you know, do it under a PUD or whatever would be necessary to get it coded, get it built and demonstrate that it would be okay. And after two or three projects, maybe other people would want to be the Pepsi to my Coke and we could change that place. But I needed to get into one place and put in the time to build the relationships, to build, you know, to implement something. And also I didn't I really want to build some high end, uh, you know, lots of custom building there's a lot of TMDs at that time uh, had put together builders guild that attracted custom builders. So I started looking around at the places where I had clients and uh, would have some level of work uh, if we picked up the family and moved out there. So in the spring of 1999, we moved to Northern California to Chico. And inside of six months, we found a uh, subdivision that uh, had been entitled as a PUD, but uh, not built because of the, the, the recession in the early 90s. And dot com, yeah. Buy it from the bank. And we, uh, we, um, we amended the PUD, no more units than were already approved under kind of a small, uh, like a patio house and duplex scheme. Uh, it was approved for, for 200 units. And so we went in and did a, we basically did a form base code and uh, just rejiggered it, uh, made the same outward connections that streets that were going to be there. And we got a, an approval, a planning commission approval in 45 days from submitting it. And they kind of held up the, the, the book we submitted is like, now we're going to make sure that it's at least this good. You know? um, and so we built the Doe Mill neighborhood uh, on that basis. Uh, 20 acres, 200 units, a mix of, of detached houses, carriage houses, um, townhouses, fourplexes, and, uh, and 22 apartments in the end. But every phase, where we, or we, and we had, we had uh, cottage courts. So every time we would introduce one of these new building types, the people that had not been able to buy a newly constructed house with an alley and an apartment over the garage uh, thought we had lost our mind and we were going to degrade their property values. So the, uh, and then we build it and then we'll be fine. So if, and then the, at the same time we were working on, uh, we did a second one in which, now to do a PUD from the beginning, you had to go in and demonstrate all the areas of the existing zoning you were not going to comply with and make the policy doc, uh, argument for why you would. So what was a 15-page document for 20 acres became a 150-page document for the next 20-acre project, at which point we were, uh, we were under contract to purchase 200 acres from the local hospital that had initially thought of, of abandoning their hospital, the center of town and going out to the edge of town. But healthcare economics being what they were, they gave up on that idea and they sold us the land. So for that, we decided to, uh, to amend the local zoning code with a section of the zoning code called the TND code, which is the form based code. Um, and uh, if you had, five acres or more, you could rezone it to TND. Um, the, um, so it could be used for some of the infill parcels that were around town. 
and uh, California has the, Envir the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. So uh, we met, navigated through that in three years, which is kind of a land speed record, uh, with an endorsement from the local environmental community. Um, and uh, we, we took the, the amendment to the, the new chapter of the zoning code through the same process. So we got that approved. And just as we were engineering the first phase, which had a county courthouse in it, and a bunch of cool stuff, um, uh, Bear Stearns went out, followed by Lehman Brothers. And uh, by the end of the year, um, the project had about 30% in local bank debt. And they, they called all the development loans, every single one, even the, you know, the ones that were performing. The thinking was you, you, the regulators were telling banks they need to mark to market. And the way to define market was, oh, you have a 200 acre uh, unimproved land with uh, paper approvals, entitlements, and you're halfway through engineering. Yeah. Uh, if that had to be sold at a bulk discount in a, in a 90 day close, what could you get for it? <laughs> oh, we lent you way more than that. Uh, we're calling your loan. So holy cow! So I was deluded out of my position because there was a cash call, and we had to replace that thirty percent with equity, and I, you know, I couldn't do it. So um, you had financial partners, like it was a syndication. Yeah, no, no, I was a minor. You know, I was a minor uh, partner in that deal. Um, and so one of the investors came up with the balance of the what was necessary to keep the project alive. And I was diluted out, and David Kim and I, uh, in the January of 2009, hung out a shingle from the little uh, shed with an air conditioner slapped in the window behind his house, and managed to, you know, put enough work together to avoid having to go back to being an electrician. Um, but it was that was a a month to month decision. And uh, what we came away from that with the idea that look. Uh, taking a long look at, as a practical matter, what could you get financed? There were there were no development loans to be had, no large scale projects to be had. Um, the uh, but you could get uh, a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA loan for one to four units. So mm -hmm. you couldn't get a construction loan for one to four units. <laughs> But if you built with cash from a hard money lender or your partner, the dentist, or the guy who owns the Ford dealership, and then you refinanced with a 30-year mortgage, what could you build? And at that time, you could do 20% of the building could be non-residential. So you could do four units plus an office. Um, and, and this uh, is at the, so you're starting to figure this out because of this, or had you already kind of known all this stuff? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I, I'm only going to put my hand on a hot stove two or three times before I figure out an alternative. Uh, the, uh, uh, and also the annual gathering of the CNU at that time was felt like a wake. It was like, cause you know, people are hanging on to their staff, hoping they'll get that next project, you know, taking out seconds on their houses so they could just keep half their staff until they got that. One, and then finally ended up laying off everybody. Um, so, and uh, instead of answering the phone and deciding what, you know, what projects not to do, uh, now there was like a $150,000 downtown, you know, plan in uh, Orange County. And I remember that like every significant C uh, uh, new urbanist firm in the country proposed on it. And I think I wow. got it or something. <laughs> So we've gone from the point where we used to collaborate with each other because nobody had a firm big enough to take on this big project to uh, we're all ready to do this small project and, and we're ready to compete with each other. So I started thinking a lot about um, the, the, the model neighborhoods and, and districts that we love, you know, Charleston, Back Bay of Boston, um, Chestnut Hill, and, you know, all these uh, and also the neighborhood I grew up on, the Central Hillside in Duluth. And um, it seemed like the 
we had, to some extent, by trying to work in the current conventions of development, we were kind of catching our patient's disease that we were building a lot, kind of sometimes the climax condition right away, you know, four-story mixed-use buildings and parking garages. And, you know, um, just scale was, was an issue because the conventional development at a large scale is driven by economy of scale. Um, and a lot of our model uh, projects that we, places that we love, these older places, were built in smaller increments. Oh. So our, my rationalization after the fact was, after being diluted out of the big project that was going to make it for me, um, was that you could aggregate a bunch of small things into something nice as a neighborhood, as a district, as a main street but it's really hard to phase a full block podium building. You're either going to build one or not. You know? So it's kind of uh, uh, brittle. Yep. Um, and the, uh, also if you're going to, if you're going to do, you know, a full block mixed use building, um, uh, your national credit tenants that will make it easier to finance have a lot to say about what you're going to build. And the, you know, you're hoping to bring in uh, multifamily, but those folks need at least 150 units to get an on-site manager to be an investment grade property so that you can get institutional money. So there are all these things that are, I think, driving things toward large scale. And so the uh, we wanted to do the smaller scale thing and see also maybe uh, – after spending a lot of time as a consultant working with developers looking to have them change their product, um, my batting average was just abysmal. You know, um, it only happened a couple of times. And even the folks that really want to build it, um, if they've come from, well, they, what, they, what they used to do was um, CVS. Uh, drug stores uh, across uh, three states. And, you know, they had totally mastered the four floor plans and the three trash enclosures and the typical parking lot arrangement and how much uh, landscape apology they were going to need to do. They got that all figured out. So now we're going to build walkable mixed use places. Anytime you hit a little bit of a speed bump, they kind of want to reach for the thing that they know works when we used to do CVSs. And, um, and if they're the money partner or the, the main operating partner, um, you know, you're going to get rolled. And I think that, um, usually the, the most, the most important lessons are learned the hard way and you really can't fault developers operating at a large scale because what they know for a certainty is that it's like, if you stray past this point, you know, you might be able to put a little filigree on it or, or, you know, make some color changes. But if you get off the true path, which is easily financeable, there, there be monsters. Right. And they're and dealing with institutional money. Yeah. Or they're know, that, with, with equity partners that yeah. uh, did fine with them when they did CVSs or yeah. 400 units of apartments at a time. So you can't fault them for um, wanting to apply what they learned the hard way. Mm-hmm. So that time, uh, I think it was a conversation with uh, Kevin Klinkenberg. Uh, he had similar experience and he says, screw it. Let's just make, you know, a thousand new developers. You know? And on the, and, and, and we'll have a different model for what a health patient is. Right? It won't be about managing symptoms, you know, of, of too much traffic count. And now you need to add a lane kind of. Let's, let's look for ways that the pattern we build in, in a mixed-use walkable environment, is in fact an amenity, as opposed to a swimming pool nobody uses, mm-hmm. or uh, a uh, Panera Bread, that, or former Panera Bread that's now a, a, a orthodontist office or something. So, the, uh, so that was the push, and then uh, and at that point... Pretty much every year, um, this was really kind of wearing my heart on my sleeve. I really wanted 
all of our friends and colleagues inside of the CNU to not experience the same financial crisis that we had. It's like the we're in the business of creating places worth caring about. It would be a good idea since we know it's going to turn out, you know, B plus or better, right? So if that's going to be the case, we should probably own some damn buildings in that place that we know is going to be good. And we can get in on the friends and family side and maybe use our, our working drawings, our, our architecture as a uh, down payment, you know, like Jonathan Siegel recommends. So I started doing sessions at CNU on understanding the numbers and asking for money. And that eventually kind of morphed into some of the curriculum for the uh, Incremental Development Alliance. And the, uh, so it was in 2015 that we did the first boot camp in August in Texas. Uh, in, was that in San Antonio? No. Okay. No, we were very organized by the time we hit San Antonio. Okay. I was going to say, because I went to that one. I think that was 2016 probably. 2016, yeah. Got no, it. It was uh, in a converted auto body shop. Uh, and we had 110 people there in an air conditioning system that was probably rated for 25. Um, so, <laughs> so after, you know, a, a death march of, you know, eight hours worth of PowerPoint, we would uh, uh, get tacos and, and drink beer in the parking lot, kind of like high school. You know? um, but it was great. Um, the first 110 people that showed up at that, a lot, I still in touch with a number of them. It was in Duncanville where Monty Anderson was. Um, and so by the end of the year, we had uh, set up as a nonprofit. We'd run six boot camps or workshops and picked up an executive director and a board. And, and so 2016 through uh, the pandemic, uh, curriculum evolved a bit. Uh, we were doing one day workshops and then weekend boot camps. Uh, you have to like bring a, bring a project to the boot camp. And then with the pandemic, we went virtual and took the boot camp content kind of online in a Zoom form. But it's not the same as like being, if it just seemed kind of decaf, you know. Right. It's locale decaf. Um, and um, so when you're right there in a room with 30 people, you're at people's elbow while they're working on their project. You're solve, helping them solve problems and learn stuff. And you see the light bulb go on kind of thing. As opposed to with Zoom, you don't know if somebody's playing Fortnite or what. You know? um, and the, the, I mean, it's better than nothing, but um, the comparison was always just really stark for me. And I, I uh, withdrew at that point. Um, the, uh, and if they start doing more in, in, if Incremental Development Alliance starts to do more in-person training, I'd be up for that again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's where, <clears throat> is that around the time you were starting to connect this idea of form follows finance or was that already before and the ink dev was just kind of a platform to be talking about that? Because that's part of what caught my attention, you know, because I've got a CPA background, I'm going in this different direction, but like that made sense to me, right? And so I perked my ears up and I was following you on Facebook. I think in 2015, I, I found you. Yeah. And then so I signed up for the program and went down there and I mean, it, it really like it's stuff that sticks with me today. Um, well, because that, it's so true, I guess, is that well, is that, the, <laughs> that four units plus an office building. Um, yeah. Live works four units plus an office on an FHA at three and a half percent down. You don't have to be wealthy. It opens up real estate yeah. to hustling and to young people and to ability for people that don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars of cash to step into something. Well, and the figure we figured, you know, let's make a thousand new developers and have them operate in a parallel system. Large production builders are up here, small guys are here, small outfits, lo hyper local. And the idea was that the large developers, those are all about, that's kind of like a, that's like strip mining or timber, it's got an extractive industry, right? Completely dominated by economies of scale. If I don't have this many units, we can't be bothered. Mm -hmm. uh, the juice is not worth the squeeze. We can't. We don't have enough units to amortize the brain damage. Whereas the smaller local arrangement, 
we can reduce brain damage by starting small and building trust with our neighbors and by extension, the elected officials and senior staff. So the, uh, uh, so when we came up with that little four unit plus an office building, we called it the farm follows finance fourplex or the four F. Right. And, uh, at the time, um, I was still, uh, very angry, uh, and uh, I wanted to call it the uh, the forum follows the smoking crater of financial death that was 2008 fourplex. But David thought that 4F was alliterative. <laughs> and uh-huh. and we, we would be a little cuddlier than my initial, you know, let me tell you about my failures and why you should avoid them kind of approach at the time. Yeah. But we sent that out to everybody we could think of saying, here, you know, let's open source this, you know, mm-hmm. here are the code and finance issues, rescan it, re, you know, we set it up with the idea that you could put it either narrow deep on a 50 foot lot or wide shallow on a hundred foot lot and put part. Right. But the, um, so it was 20, 2011. We presented that at CNU and at the CNU uh, council that met in Montgomery. Um, and then the developers of Hampstead uh, uh, wanted to do some of the, did four of those. Uh, and that kind of, that's the first time we got one actually built. Uh, what's happened since then is finding out that most jurisdictions, you know, three units or more, you got to have fire sprinklers. So uh, four units, uh, plus a little office under FHA, Fannie Freddie should be two duplexes or it should be buildings divided with a rated wall as a, what would be a townhouse under the building code. But we found that uh, planning departments, when they got that permit set to review, it was like, no, no, for you guys, this is multifamily and that's an allowed use. It's only townhouse because that's the IBC, I. IRC building code definition. You guys have your own zoning definition of townhouse, which requires a property line. So, uh, so there's a lot of, uh, we, we tweaked the, the code analysis page that goes on the, on the cover. Um, yeah. Or you do it as two duplexes. The, um, but the ability to get, uh, and now there are more and more uh, 30-year loans available for small multifamily. The, uh, the small balance loan that Freddie Mac came out with created a uh, – like Freddie Mac has always been the more innovative, and then Fannie Mae will uh, take whatever products they come up with and make them slightly more shitty, diluted. <laughs> Uh, and, and what is this product that they did? The small balance? Small what, what exactly is it? Five to hundred units. Um, what's nice about it is a five to hundred units on a 30 year mortgage. Yeah. No, there's is a, a 20 year hybrid, a 20 year uh, hybrid. Yeah. And, and basically is that, is it just easier to get a loan like that than just going through your local bank? Because the local bank's going to carry that commercial loan versus this is basically yeah, back well, quote, unquote, by the government. And they'll, They'll uh, they'll look for you to uh, pay in some fees and renew it in five, seven, or ten years. Uh, as a they'll look for you to do what? To for you to renew that commercial mortgage. Got it. Five years, seven. Ten. And and so is it a lot better than what you get at a commercial? I mean, because if it's on a twenty-year amortization, that doesn't sound that much different to me than no, just a commercial. No, your amortization. The term of the loan is twenty, so you have a balloon. Oh, but the amortization is what? Twenty-five. I see. I see. And 25 is what you'll typically get on those five, seven, 10 year loans. The thing yeah. is that all of those are going to be personally guaranteed. And that, right. that limits you in terms of your credit. Whereas the, the yeah. uh, small balance loan is a non-recourse loan. And yeah. you can get it in place once you have uh, 90% occupancy for 90 days. So you don't have a two year seasoning period before you get your five-year loan. Um, Got it. Um, so it does. It actually opens up quite a five to hundred. When did that come out? Uh, that came out in 20, 2016 or 17. Okay, um, interesting. Do you know if it's being used much? Uh, like, yeah, do you know no, anyone using them within CNU or T&Ds? 
it's I don't know about seeing your T and D's, but um, yeah, it's being used quite a bit. Okay. Uh, which is why uh, Fannie Mae got into it and did their kind of B plus version. Um, got it. So, you just have to go to a local bank that's you know offering those types of loans, and then you know that okay. Yeah, but the um, the small balance loans are only through participating lenders, bigger outfits, um, right? Greystone and uh, yeah. Fair. Are there any other loan products that you know? Because I'm aware of the the FHA and the 203 and the 203K for people with really low balances or whatever. Just um, and the reason well, I like the, the it's really finding a, something that you can purchase on a conventional mortgage, like a live work unit. You know, like we're kind of debating with the municipality right now because they're wanting it to be an IBC building, like a full on IBC building. We're um, arguing for residential. And actually the part that got their attention was when we started talking about, Hey, we don't, we're not doing it from our perspective. We're, we're doing it so that people can buy it easier. And they were like, Oh, oh and honestly, that reframed the conversation. It wasn't us trying to be crazy or, yeah. you know, well, get, away, well, the, get away with something. Fannie and Freddie both have loan products that are good for one to four units. Right. And a certain, and, uh, either 20, I think it's 35% non-res. Okay. So the, and you can, uh, you can get, a, get into them uh, either as a homeowner or as an investor with 25% down. And the, but those same loan products are available for, if you wanted to, um, you can get them as a purchase rehab mortgage where you're going to buy a building, turn it into a duplex and add an ADU, you know, right. um, the, um, uh, or you you could ref, you could do a purchase rehab as a basically a refinance, uh, and the only thing you're rehabbing is the uh, you're adding the ADU. Yeah. So um, and those are good at depending on your income and your your physical location. Uh, both Fannie and Freddie have three and a half percent down uh, models and five percent down models. Now what's the reason why those are better than the two or three K FHA loan, you have to have uh, private mortgage insurance for the life of the loan. And that's, Oh, interesting. That's, that's, that's a problem. If you're doing four units, you know, that, mm-hmm. that PMI payment every month really smarts. Um, the, uh, so with Fannie and Freddie, their PMI is, is a better policy to begin with. The main reason being, and a bunch of the terms are good, but the main reason that they're much better is that as soon as you can demonstrate 20% equity, you can cancel the private mortgage insurance. So, you know, you might be able, Got it. You might be able to build 20% equity between, because your construction loan on the front end is going to be a percentage of cost, right? Right. So if you got a, uh, you know, personally guaranteed construction loan, maybe with a partner, and that's like borrowing four dollars for raw material to make seven pizzas. And by the time you're done with seven pizzas, they're worth way more than four dollars. Mm-hmm. So the uh, so you have a conventional construction loan, which is entirely a province of local small banks. Yeah, um, Bank of America is not going to do it for you. Out of curiosity, well, but then you're going to if you were sorry, there's just a tad of lag, so I might be missing something. Sorry. So. You have a conventional uh, construction loan from a local community bank. They're the ones that have the infrastructure to administer draws. Regional banks sometimes offer small construction loans, but it's usually going to be your credit union or your local community bank. Mm-hmm. And then the when you go to refinance, once it's built, um, Fannie and Freddie will do the appraisal based on potential rents with you show examples that yeah, I can get those rents. Um, that becomes the, that becomes whether or not you can support the mortgage. And that's really at that point, how much equity you have becomes the difference between what it costs and what the value is. Mm-hmm. So you could end up uh, with a, basically uh, you could do a cash out and pay off an investor. And then a couple of years later, you have 20% equity to, um, retire the PMI or, huh. you know, if you're working with your own capital, you could just, you know, get it without PMI because you have 20. Right. 
Um, that makes sense. But the uh, the other loan products that have emerged um, since 2012, 2015 uh, are the uh, debt service coverage loans from private lenders. And with those, they're 30 year loans, 30 year amortization. Um, and it's entirely based on your debt service coverage. Huh? Oh, someone was talking to me about this recently. I, can you, can uh, you uh, unpack well, it a little bit? It, I'd never heard of it, it before. So the, um, the, they're called DSCR loans because we need way mm -hmm. more acronyms than we currently have in this business. So it stands for debt service coverage ratio. So if, uh, after expenses, uh, your cash flow is 125% of your debt service. If you've got a dollar and a quarter for every dollar you have to pay the bank. Right. Uh, the, uh, and sometimes uh, DC, D, DCSR uh, loans will go down as, as low as, as 110%. Got it. So the, uh, and the, uh, and the difference between, can I get it at 110% and, you know, the 120, 120, 125 is typically the floor is how conservative have you been with your operating expenses? You know, the, um, are you, are you really pushing the limit and you're, and you're maybe not, you know, you're going to pay 4% of rents to your property manager. That's no, you know, the, uh, you're not setting aside any reserves. Yeah. We'll lend if those are going to be your numbers. We'll lend to you at one hundred one point three five, you know, because hmm. they don't want to get it back. Um, the and the folks that broker those loans are in the business. They're you know they're more commercial mortgage brokers. You know they're they're looking to make. Would it help you? I'm trying to think like what what are the implications of you? What are the implications on the DSCR of you qualifying for it? Because I'm trying to think like why would I go with the DSCR? Uh, over something else. Uh, well, I guess it's 30 years. So, I mean, it could be a commercial project. So it's, you can even do that on a commercial project because you're renting it out. You're getting, you're just using your NOI and. Yep. Okay. Uh, and the other reason is typically uh, the bank, the, the loan is based entirely on the fact that this building is a business that makes money. So uh, no, no income tax returns, no personal financial statement, no credit report, so oh here, so wow! It's just here, like here's the leases. Well, that 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 no, is pretty nice. Oh, because it's non-recourse. Like it's here's an appraisal that says that I can get this kind of money, and here are the comparable leases in the area. So got it. So is the, it a non-recourse one as well? Um, it depends. Um, uh, typically non-recourse will be another five hundred basis points in interest. Got it. Or another half of you know another half or three quarter point in fees, uh, or both. Um, Got it. Okay. The, okay. Uh, so, since it is a debt service coverage loan, uh, if you can um, generate a lot of value because you are self performing the work, or you bought a shuttered muffler shop and it had a big gravel parking lot and you created seven parcels out of it. Yeah, if you if you can create a lot of value, um, then it makes a lot of sense. And even though it's a slightly higher interest rate, and you might pay instead of one point or point and a half, you might pay two or three points. Um, the you're not you're not having to go and get um, either an equity partner uh, to put cash into the deal, or to sign a, a personal guarantee because you know. This is bigger than your net worth. Mm -hmm. So for a small developer, uh, DCS, debt service coverage ratio loan makes a lot of sense. So now that's cool. You I'm glad you brought it up because I'd heard about it recently when I was trying to do something and I hadn't fully realized all the implications of it. So I'm glad you brought it up. Are there any other financial instruments you find interesting that are good for small developers and, or even things that are in the works? Um, the, I think the other things to look at uh, for small developers are to think serious for, you know, for very young small developers, 
um, you know, maybe singles or young couples with small children uh, to look at some form of house hacking right. where you do a duplex, triplex, fourplex where you can count 75% of the gross income uh, toward your income to qualify for the loan. Right. So you might have a, uh, well, my son is a public school teacher, elementary school teacher. And on his salary, he cannot qualify for a mortgage. Even him and his wife both working can't qualify for a mortgage to get a house in Seattle. So they're renting. Uh, but if they were to do a fourplex, uh, they could live almost rent free. Right. And so, you can do that <clears throat> to go get the construction loan. You can say, hey, you know, there's three units. We're going to rent out the appraisal of what the, you don't have to have signed leases, do you? It's basically the no. appraised value of what those leases it's will be. Value. And then it yeah. has to be your primary residence for one year. Right. But And then you can put 5% happen. down. But, but when you do that, uh, well, you might have to come up with 20, 25% down on the construction loan. Right. Uh, but only 5% down on the mortgage to pay it off. Right. And some of the money that's generated in that uh, could go to pay off a capital partner. Right. Uh, but the uh, and there, you're still going to have personal guarantees on both the mortgage and the, the construction loan. But it's a way to get started. Um, and I think anything that you can do on the front end, um, I'm, I'm thinking very, uh, I'm very bullish on corridors of crap. Um, the, the place where the suburban zoning extends along the, the arterial road into the streetcar served in 1920 part of, part of town. The, the, um, and I think that's where uh, sprawl repair has real potential. Those are typically, you know, if you look at the, the zoning map, the corridor will be like red for commercial. And then right across the back fence of, of the, the McDonald's, it's, yeah, it's yellow for single family house right? mm -hmm. or sometimes multifamily. Right. But the, uh, but it's not particularly often if it's single family, those are one car garage and carport, right. uh, 1200 square foot houses that have a big mature trees that have been rented to death. So, yeah, that condition exists all over the country. So to be able to uh, come up with uh, a community that is over retailed and has a lot of vacant uh, strip space, particularly anchorless strip space after it's no longer viable for off brand mobile phones, nail salons and little Caesars. Um, and you end up with a bunch of vacancy in, say, a six or 7,000 foot strip, which is parked at five spaces per thousand square feet. Okay. Um, I've seen those buildings go for, you know, again, it's a function of, of what you could lease it for. I've seen buildings like that go for 25 to $40 a square foot for CMU slab, CMU bar joist, flat roof, expired package plant. Uh, you know, HVAC. And then on the backside, because some of these had loading docks, uh, there's room to build as well. So to go into a building like that um, and maybe, and those are typically 40 to 60 foot deep bays. The ones that go broke early are the ones with 80 foot deep bays because, mm -hmm. you know, and they've got like 25 feet of glass and all this square footage and they really can't make it productive in terms of generating income outside of maybe a restaurant. So you take that and you split it uh, longitudinally, put in your new sewer line. And instead of a, a narrow, deep storefront, now you got a wide shallow. And if that's yeah. an office or whatever, you're, you're in a low base. Right. And then on the backside of that, since these are typically 14 to 16 foot plates, you put in a loft over a bathroom and a kitchenette and a roll up garage door with glazing in it, hmm. a man door, and it's a live work. Yeah. Or a that's a great hack for some of these trip centers. Yeah. Because the, the structure is going to be there. It's like right. CMU, steel columns, bar joists, you know. Um, right. The, uh, 
So to demise it, you run, you know, run a utility trench down, down the middle, um, make your stubs and uh, build it out when, as you get tenants. So somebody that used to have way too much square footage and very little glass now gets lots of glass and not so much square footage. And better optimized right. <clears throat> space. And you probably have room in the parking lot for some liner buildings. Oh. Uh, so the also when people are looking for small commercial space, particularly for office or service businesses, uh, if someone wants six or 700 square feet, they don't want to like open the door and find a dirt floor because you're waiting to see what kind of plumbing they needed. Yeah. Um, the set it up so that you could tap the sewer line if you needed to for a, a salon, but you know, they get, everybody gets their own bathroom. Mm-hmm. You got polished concrete floor and uh, some, uh, uh, some vinyl floor in the bathroom. And yeah. They, if somebody's looking for that kind of space, they typically want to move in 30, 60 days. Right. And the competition for that type of space is the second floor space in the crappy building that's going to take you two months to get the internet. You know? Yeah. And I've had offices in those kind of buildings quite a bit. <laughs> uh, you want the space now, once you're in, you know, I mean, the building owners, they could have raised, they could have doubled my rent. I would have stuck around. You know? Right. What else am I going to get? Small space is hard to find. Yeah. Um, I got two weeks of disrupt the business while I move my stuff. And then yeah. I'm paying up for, you know, using my phone as a hotspot because I can't get the Comcast. Sh- can't find my suite in the building. You know, it tells me, you know, even though there's a sports bar downstairs, it's got cable all over the place. tells me that they don't have cable to serve the building. Yeah. So if you can give somebody direct access, no common hallway, you know, the only common area is the parking lot and the sidewalk. Yeah. Um, so it's a um, nice little hack. I mean, really, cause I, there's so many, my guess is over the next decade, two decades, three decades, you're going to see a lot of these, I, I don't know, as, as we talked about earlier, centralization, like as things get more spread out, things have to become more centralized. Then you take on incorporate online shopping and stuff to where the, you know, like we go to the store list because we order so much off Amazon, which can actually, like in some ways that's bad, I would say, or like could be bad because then you're not interacting as much, yada, yada. But at the same time, it could actually make the pathways for better human scaled urbanism. Because if we don't have to have these giant centralized places to just get basic goods, but then we can have shared spaces that are experiential experientially based that are smaller and kind of more distributed well, I think it's going to um, be where the economics work out differently. I think it's going to be aggregated into big, large format stores like Lowe's and Home Depot and whatever, you know, uh, and smaller stuff that's closer in. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. You're going to have to have those big stores to like the Lowe's and things. You really yeah. can't but scale see, that down. So that I'm aware of, I think what we're likely to see is the, um, like Amazon now uh, is putting in the yellow lockers, you know, at the grocery store or whatever. Yeah. Uh, for people that uh, had a bad experience with porch pirates, um, get your stuff delivered to the yellow locker in the 24 hour yep. Kroger. Or whatever. Um, I think what's going to happen, there'll be a little, I don't know. You. Uh, this is probably, yeah, this is before your time. There used to be a company called service merchandise, which had a catalog. And you would go to the counter, it's like going to Granger. You go to the counter, and they they bring out your TV and they give it to mm-hmm. you. And there's no display space apart from like right. immediately in and around the counter area. Just mostly printed display. Yeah. So, I think what's going to end up happening with Amazon is that they'll be taking over failed Kmart's, Targets, etc. And uh, or because uh, right now in Atlanta. There are four uh, Amazon uh, installations where uh, they lease the parking lot and put up a, a chain link fence to park their delivery vans in. And it's a, and then the the Kmart is a you know an antique mall or something. You know, it's just using the husk for cheap rent. Uh, I think we'll see them 
even doing purpose built or redeveloped uh, large format places where they can have inventory and you can come and pick it up. You know, you order it and you say, well, you know, uh, rather than wait a couple of days for delivery, you could drive to the other side of town, pick it up uh, and have it here for you. So yeah, we're seeing that. I mean, there's already drive through grocery store that just came to Oklahoma city. Like it's just kind of another iteration of that where you, there's a big store there, but you don't go in it and you just go through the drive through get your bag, go same thing. It's just a pickup. I, I can totally well, see it'd that. Be, it'd be like, People screwing up your McDonald's order on steroids. Yeah. No, no. I said organic olive oil. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that the, um, so corridors of crap, I, I, I think are going to present a lot of opportunity where you could get owner financing on, you know, a, a six unit, 10,000 foot strip. Uh, and the reason why they want to sell it is that they got a lot of vacancy the roof is starting to fail. The HVAC is toast, you know, and the parking lot needs resurfacing. So it's like, right. you know, it's down to the bones. So yeah. you, you make bone broth, you, you make, right. yeah. <laughs> you make gumbo, you know, yeah. so I think that the, uh, the thing is that you need an enterprise that is being built for rent rather than built for sale. Uh, because the for sale model is, is driven by what would someone pay for something similar within a certain radius within the same school district by the square foot. Yep. So if you have something that's based on your net operating income, that the, it's a building that makes money. Right. Uh, now you have a financial basis to get into it. Plus you don't have somebody that is uh, counting on you to uh, close on the 30th of, of July. Right. And otherwise you're looking at a, you know, a month's worth of Hampton in bills and storage yep. and a customer that will never recommend you to anybody else. So I think that the, for small folks starting out, uh, building or renovating something for rent, uh, is yeah. a much, much better play, but that also means you need to take a serious interest in what your, what your tax structure is going to be. Yeah. Um, I think that, um, uh, the other thing to consider is if you are, if you, if you can see, you know, the matrix and you can see that, Oh, if I take on this strip center, uh, uh, a bunch of those vacant lots in that 1950 subdivision, you know, within a quarter mile are going to be available. I need to find a partner to maybe, uh, land bank that stuff. Um, I don't want to drive a lot of value into this and not be able to harvest it. So every project has to pencil, but if you are creating, you know, more than the sum of the parts, you're creating synergy and value, walkability, amenities. If somebody decides to lease the Episcopal church Sunday school to a daycare operator, that's now an amenity for your property, yep. you know, a quarter mile away. So the, what we found building bungalow courts for sale, cottage courts for sale, was we made a lot of money for the first buyers. And we had to wrestle with the appraisers and all that, right? But once it's done, it's like, oh, this is great. It's like, so if you're making the place progressively better and better and better, you need to hang on to at least some buildings to be able right, to long enough to value and have passive income so you can survive the next economic whipsaw. Right. And not have to lay off all your staff. Anyway, I've had very, uh, very limited success uh, trying to con convert uh, design firms, folks in design firms, to being developers. Um, and also, they are the they're the most difficult students and proteges because um, they the culture in urban design and architecture is often that somehow, first of all, they don't get any actual training in business or finance. Right. It's mysterious. They don't know why the client needs a building really. Right. You know, or, or why it would be a problem if it took too long and cost too much. And now I don't need a building at all because I'm out of business. So the, and also culturally somehow, uh, design firms are, are, have, you know, kind of one foot on the boat and one on the dock in terms of, is this art or science? And if it yeah. feels more arty, then somehow 
understanding uh, the money side of it would somehow contaminate your art. Totally. Yeah. I, I, <clears throat> yeah. So I've sensed that from what, what I've seen from a lot of architects is if they have a problem that is a, uh, a deal structure problem or a bank problem, you know, they went to one bank and the, the term sheet they got was awful, right? Their first response is to reach for what they know works, which is to redesign the whole project. You know, it's like, mm. no, you need to go to at least two or three more banks, you know? Yeah. that's interesting. Or, you know, so the, uh, I mean, there was a point where uh, you know, we went from a system of guilds and master builders where design and construction were integrated. Yeah. And we moved from that to specialization where you now have the design professions and the building trades. Yeah. And we reconnect those with symbolic drawings, contracts, depositions, meeting <laughs> minutes, um, the, uh, and draw schedules. What could possibly go wrong? And lean waivers, yeah. Yeah. So I think the um, I think small operators need to be able to be um, uh, convert. You know, not fluent, but at least conversational on design, on entitlement, on banking, finance, operations. All those pieces it needs to be reintegrated at a scale that their team of uh, their merry band of pirates uh, yep. can function. And I think it's, you know, um, it'll end up continuing to operate on a parallel system. Again, the large yep. outfits need economy of scale. The small ones are governed by economy of means. Yeah. Like in my neighborhood, Javier and uh, his nephew are my plumber. Yeah. And they're great at a certain scale. I mean, right. They have a truck with a different color fender. Right. Javier's wife keeps the books. You know, we all know people yeah. who are trades like that. Pe people don't understand that scale. Like, it's not just a matter of like, oh, you're just doing the same thing, but more of it in the same way. Things completely change at scale about how things are done. Like that. That's, and I think I've all, or I've known that for a long time, but I'm coming to appreciate that more and more of just like, you need things that are big scale. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, no, you do need things that are big scale, but I mean, I'm, I'm like you where I'm like, let's do more small scale stuff well, because you really scale. can't, when, once you get too big of a scale, you just can't. Scale, you can get efficiency. With yeah. Efficiency. Scale, but with small scale, you can get agility. And I think that. That's, that's yeah. Yeah. That's know, a good way to the, say it. Um, it's like if, if, uh, if I wanted to do, if I wanted to renovate a 40 unit apartment building, um, I couldn't use Javier and his nephew. I would have to now compete with one of the comp planning, the plumbing companies that has uh, seven trucks and 30 guys. And, you know, so what do I have for them after the 40 units? Nothing. You know? So on a good day, I'm going to get the junior varsity, you know, yep. or worse. And yep. my bid is going to reflect the fact that, Hey, if we take this on, we might have to delay starting work on the new life sciences building at the university. So we better really get paid. You know? Um, and also, we don't know this guy. It's the first time we're working with him. You know, whereas I can I can work out uh, a per fixture uh, price, you know, a per trap price with Javier. You know, right. Uh, we can do unit pricing and uh, cover uh, uh, cost escalations as a as an ad. Yeah. Uh, and also, the Javier is really interested in you know renovating, owning his own buildings, you know, yeah. as opposed to you know, the three guys that showed up on the plumbing van from XYZ plumbers. Nah. If you think about this as like the big operations are like English and Imperial, right? And then the small operators metric, right? Now, if, if it's 1978 and you have a, your own private auto garage and you're working on both American cars and German cars, right? English Imperial and metric before Detroit shifted to metric. Um, you're going to have one bay in which all of your metric tools have red electrician's tape around them. So you don't mix them with the other ones. You can't cross thread this stuff. And you got to recognize that, yeah, I'm going to pay a little bit of a premium for a metric part. You know? But if I want to go full on English and Imperial, I gotta, I'm going to spend a lot of money at the snap-on truck when they come through. 
So the, if we were always comparing what you need to understand how the large operations work, you know, just the broad strokes and uh, the, what the pitfalls are, because there's a temptation to try to take your small operation to scale by always doing a bigger project than the last one. Mm. And that works until the music stops and you don't have a chair um, and you're in the middle of a big project. And then now the bank gets your big project. So a lot of folks in development have been doing that two or three times, depending on how many recessions they've been through um, or how many times the, the big uh, the steel plant closed or whatever would whatever big rock gets thrown into your small pond. Mm. So I think that it's better for small operators to have a steady stream of small containable projects where you have an opportunity to learn and then refine it for the next time. Right. Yeah. You know, you're making Incremental. craft beer, you know, you, that new recipe, you don't want to put that in the big brew tank. You, you want to right. it small. So also you want to find somebody who's made something similar before. Right. Right. Well, John, I would actually, I've got like so many questions that I didn't even get to, but I'm wondering, I think we just, uh, call it a day today, but, but set up a time for a future in a few months or a couple months and, sure. and, and talk, uh, dive more in. Cause you're such a wealth of knowledge on the practical, like you blend the art and the science, I guess you could say. And, uh, and, and you have experience at kind of larger scales, but you work and think in smaller scales. And I think that's so valuable to have both perspectives, um, but really be operating in, in, in one. Um, well, well, if you told me, you know, in at CNU four that, you know, yeah, you seem to be appreciating the technical side of this. And Leon certainly has filled your head with stuff that what this is really going to come down to is about validating other people's feelings and communicating effectively and doing active listening. I would have stayed an electrician. That just, <laughs> it's a lot of feelings, you know, and, uh, and we can be stubborn and say, no, no, it's going to be about technical stuff. Uh, it's going to be about the craft and I'm going to find my customers and I'm not going to have to deal with people's feet. No, we are not rational beings. We are beings that rationalize after we make an emotional decision. And that, that's a good one. And that, that comes into any kind of entitlement or getting the utility companies to change or whatever else. Hey, we should do a session. Honestly, I need to hear this, John, cause I'm kind of in that. I think I'm going through this state where I'm building real confidence from having done real things. And by the way, I've been knocked on my ass quite a few times these past few years. At the same time, I'm trying to figure out how to communicate, you know, because now I'm becoming more of a communicator and a vision caster and trying to get people on board. And because I think of things in terms of systems and not individual people, like when I'm talking about experts or the system, I'm not talking about individuals and all those crappy individuals out there, you know, they're just terrible. I'm, I'm really talking about it's so stupid how the system said, although it's kind of brilliant, like we're, and then we've optimized this system. We're really good at optimizing the incentive structure that's there. I mean, we're brilliant. I mean, that's why capitalism is so freaking amazing. Yep. It's just the wrong system that we're optimizing. But well, I've noticed that as I say things out loud, people are coming back hard being like, Hey, how dare you? And you're like, Whoa, I wasn't, I mean, I can see why you, <laughs> well, people when I can... look back, I can see why you're getting on to me, but that's not how I intended it. Well, the, uh, you could go to uh, a charrette that maybe had a lecture or whatever. And I saw this with Andreas's crew quite a bit. The, the comments afterwards was, well, you know, that Andreas guy did nothing but pick on architects or planners or city officials or realtors or contractors. And it's like whoever you were as a contractor, what you heard was criticism of your line of work or as an elected official or whatever. The rest just kind of, you know, washed over you. So I think that the, uh, if you are serious about communication, you need to uh, reduce the mass of people in this business, you know, because often there are a type or an archetype, right? You need to actually personalize it to my friend Bob, the appraiser. And I've had so many, you know, adult mm. beverages with Bob coming to understand about what life is like as an appraiser. And 
you know, and you'll find that an appraiser will have the best critique of the limitations of his field. You know, same with a banker, same with an architect, you know, the, um, uh, and also I like people, that people tend to, you know, uh, Jim Kunstler remarked once that if you're in a room of a hundred people, your first assumption is that 99 of them have their shit together. Hmm. No, everybody is fronting to some extent, right? Even people that are really skilled right. are usually fairly far out of, they're like a major league pitcher that can throw a 90 mile an hour fastball, but can't walk in a straight line because they're, they're, <laughs> Their physicality is adapted to just fastball pitching, right? Yeah. So they're hiding the fact that they walk funny. You know? So people that are really accomplished are often a little out of balance. People that are still learning don't want anybody else to know that they don't know everything yet. So as fragile and as uh, petty as we are, as hairless apes involved in, in tribal activity, <laughs> it's like that's the baseline of where we're at. You think about, you want to go build a building, you can't go too far down that process without getting somebody to come out and do a soils test, right? Oh. Because because if you're, I mean, around here, if you're building on gumbo soil, you're going to have a big-ass footing, right? Otherwise, the oh. building's going to fall over or settle you know, dramatically. So, And the reality that that soil is not only going to bear so much makes you build a big footing. You know, yeah. you could disagree with that. You could be really upset about that or whatever it's like, but that's the base condition, right? So I think that a lot of our uh, genuine learning needs to be about what's the base condition. How yeah. petty, venal, and stupid and hostile are the people involved in this project? Oh, not so much. Oh, well, we could probably learn a lot together. Yeah. If folks are, are really upset, because there's going to be a renter over your garage, you know, you shouldn't be proposing a 70 unit building. You know? right. so, because you're going to need those relationships to be able to operate in that small onesy twosy environment. Cause you're yeah. not, it's like the, for the big guys, you know, Hey, if we're going to do 400 units, we may as well do 4,000 because the litigation will cost the same. Right. So I think we need to be much more attuned to, uh, building the kind of relationships of trust and communicating effectively. That's been the hardest lesson for me because I, I like to think that I've got a pretty good handle on things. And if people just shut up and get the hell out of my way, we can make great things. happen. And that does not work. And you can disappoint a lot of people that way. And mm -hmm. you can make money and lose it a lot of times over, you know, I've been through three recessions uh, and I'm still crawling out of the last one. So, yeah. And well, John, thanks so much. And and is there anywhere, I know you're on Facebook, is there anywhere that people could follow you or follow what you're up to or all the, the knowledge? I know the InkDev website, is, is it still called InkDev or is it Small Developers Builders? I can't remember. Uh, no, it's called Incremental Development. It is still called, okay. IncrementalDevelopment.org. Okay. Uh, but you can, uh, if you give me a little pressure uh, by telling people this, I'll post more often. My blog is rjohnthebad.com. rjohnthebad.com. Yeah. Okay. And we'll put that in a we'll link in the, the description one. too. Well, John, I'll, I'll I look you. forward to having you back on. I'll give you the origin story for why it's John the Bad. So. Ah, yeah. Okay. Let's do that. We'll, we'll do that. And then I want to get into uh, yeah, some other real estate stuff and even, even, even other financial financing mechanisms, maybe even crowdfunding and uh, fun stuff. So. Okay. Take, All right, yeah, John. I've got a uh, uh, set of uh, hacks and workarounds for the new Houston uh, code amendments they just passed. That could be a oh, got it. Interesting. That could be a, a show and tell thing. Okay, cool. All right, well, John, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Take care. Good I, to see you. Yeah. Good to see you. Bye. Bye.